Welcome to One Tough Podcast. I'm joined here, as like always, with my man, Carlo. Good morning, everybody. Yeah, today we got a couple of good, exciting things. First, we're going to talk about some current events. Then two friends of mine, Joe and Tim DeMarco, are going to come in because I just happen to be a partner with them on a massive new project, probably the Emmy Award-winning Next TV series, whether it be on Amazon, Netflix, or wherever it is, it's going to be a winner. When you put the DeMarcos and Bo together, it explodes. It seems like it's a really great project, something that I've been interested in for a long time, so I uh, can't wait to get them on and talk more about it. Right. But it's let's... about the... Hold on. It, let's tell the audience what it's about. It's about the most notorious murdering gang in the history of New York City, Roy DeMeo crew. Okay? We'll get back to that. But let's talk about some Yeah, there's some, some current hot stuff. issues, Bo, All right. and I want to get your take on it. So in the news recently, it was reported that Bill de Blasio, our mayor, and his wife, Big Shirley Bird, McRae, you mean Big Bird, right? Uh, they have wasted about $1.8 billion of our hard-earned taxpayer dollars. Uh, to go to what? I don't know. So, Bo, let's talk a little bit about this. Well, you know, it's very simple. All of a sudden, Charlene McRae, the, the wife of the mayor, I think it's about $1 billion. It's more. She, more. she, she pissed. No, no, I'm just talking about the mental okay, health yeah. side. To renew schools. When I ran for mayor, I talked about this Fugazi thing, and I said it was just a waste of money. So that's about $800 million. For, for a school renewal program that, you know, so far has yielded no results. It was a total failure when he started it. And when I ran for mayor, I, I used it as one of my platforms. The real serious thing is this mental health issue. In reality, we're talking about almost $1 billion of funds that went into all these nonprofits. I am calling out to my good friend, the city council president. What's his name? Corey Johnson. Corey Johnson to have hearings. I want uh, a stringer. What's his first name? Scott Stringer, the comptroller. The controller. I want to put him and grill him. Where did this billion dollars go? I'll tell you where it went. It goes to nonprofits, and no one knows. They take down these enormous salaries. These are people who are fugazi people. They just open up a storefront nonprofit, and they get money. They take these enormous annual salaries, and then all of a sudden, money's funneled through there for different things. And then all of a sudden... We don't know where this billion dollars went. I'll tell you, I've been a detective my whole life, and I know two criminals when I see one. Bill de Blasio and his wife, I'll guarantee you, will follow that money, and there's going to be money ear back to some slush fund that that money is going through. Follow the billion dollars to the mental health thing, where it was dished out, and where that money went. I want to see an accountant of every dollar of that billion dollars, where it went, where it was transposed, because I'll guarantee you, I got a feeling in my nose, you know, I'm a good detective. Absolutely. I say that this is going to be one of the biggest corruption things, and I want to get deputized. I want to come back as a U.S. attorney deputy, and I want to put handcuffs on Bill de Blasio and his wife, because I guarantee you, we've got illicit funds being coffered to their needs. I think it's completely despicable that they would use something like mental health to do this because, you know, I have a, I have a friend. He's yeah. been struggling with some issues, and uh, he called around different psychiatrists, therapists. And he couldn't get it he done. He couldn't get an appointment. You know, here's another one. He couldn't one. even get an appointment. I mean, to, they, you know, they— the One billion dollars pissed away. Now, the real one bad is—we call him. We call him— Asians now, you can't call them Chinese, but these are Chinese people downtown, which they are Chinese. How about the largest suicide rate are Asian Americans, Chinese? Do you know how much of that billion dollars went down to Chinatown? Nada. She didn't even mark one dollar to the poor Chinese people committing suicide. These are on our lowest poverty rate, lowest poverty le levels. Now this big bird de Blasio comes back out and he wants to stop these Asian kids that study every night and day to try to get into the good schools. Now they want to limit them. That's bull crap. That's racist, man. Hey, if these kids study all night and they get good marks, God bless them. I don't care if you're black, white, Spanish. 
You you make the marks. You got the best marks. The best marks should get it. They should be rewarded for the hard work they do, not compromised and taken away from it. I get really angry about this. Yeah, stuff. it's a it's a major controversy with the specialized high schools here in New York City. Uh, for people that don't know, uh, these are free public schools available to anyone. There's no tuition, uh, and the only requirement is that you have to have good grades and pass a specialized test. And the mayor uh, thinks that it's not fair, uh, a test that's just, you know, you answer this question. And one more topic before we bring our esteemed guests in. Murders on the rise. I think it's up 40%. Rapes are up about 20%. Here we go. We said it a while ago. When you don't enforce these small crimes and when cops are not effectively dealing with them, walking away, not getting involved, now you come up with a new proposal. The cams on the camera, cams on cops, they could be given publicly out there. I'm going to tell you what's going to happen, Carlo. It's going to be on TV, on the news. The first part, the guy smacks the cop. All of a sudden, the cop goes and tries to handcuff, tries to arrest him, use necessary force. You know what you're going to see on the newsreel? The cop fight with the guy hitting the guy, and that's going to be your newsreel. And then we're going to have a more division. Ooh. It's really scary to know that the murder rate in New York went up in February. Because uh, as we know, crime happens to go down in the winter. It's months. colder than the witches did out there. So when it when the summer comes, I'm just uh, very afraid of what might happen once the weather. Well, let me better. tell you something. This is now, and I said it before. And no, Carlo, I will never run for mayor of this city again. I had it up to here. Okay, you got Big Bird, and you got his wife. The most corrupt, I will guarantee it sure as we're sitting here, when this investigation starts, and it's got to be a federal investigation by the U.S. Attorney's Office, because I don't think the state can do a proper investigation. You know, with my friend Andrew and uh, my other friend Letitia, you know, I don't think they could do a proper investigation. we got to bring in independent people. So what do you think about de Blasio going to Iowa and trying to maybe gauge a run for president? Yeah, they, I think there were six people. Yeah, nobody showed up. Six people throwing up on himself, and he was talking to himself, and those stupid sideburns. What does he think? He's Abraham Lincoln? He's got sideburns down to his chin now. He looks like a friggin' idiot. That's six foot six of garbage. Ugly garbage. Well, the 70s had, they had a lot of sideburns, and there was also a lot of crime, so maybe he just wants to bring that back. Okay, Carlo. Let's let's not waste any more time. Let's bring in our esteemed guest, Great. okay? Great. Wait to talk to you. All right. Joey! Timmy! Okay, so today I got two of my friends here, Joe and Tim DeMarco. So they come to me a couple of years ago, and they said, Bo, we got this great project. It's about this gang in Brooklyn, Roy DeMeo's crew. I looked at them, and I went back. I said, Roy DeMeo's crew? I remember John Gotti Sr. talking about them. And I remember being a homicide detective in Brooklyn, hearing about them. This was a notorious gang. The part about this gang... Was, uh, was interesting is I believe what is five or six were the, were the gang members? How many? It was about, about, five. Yeah, about six. And what were the names? You had Roy DeMeo, who was the uh, boss. The boss. You had uh, Henry uh, Borelli. Har Harvey Chris Rosenberg, Henry Borelli, the Gemini twins, Joey Testa, Anthony Senta. You had Joe Dracula, Guillermo. Um, and then you had Vito Arena, the gay hitman. So, and basically, how many people do you think that they murdered? Hundreds. Yeah, hundreds. If not thousands. Yeah. Thousands? What is this is the most prolific gang of serial killers in history. The reason this story hasn't been told before broadly, why we don't know them like Charles Manson, let's say, is because whereas other serial killers find their way in anonymous, you know, work-a-day jobs, these guys found their anonymity in the dark underbelly of organized crime. They committed their reign of terror between 1969 and 1982. Uh, the, the police investigated and can attribute, I think, roughly 300 homicides to them, right. but it could be north of 1,000. Wow. Wow. So this story, when we were talking about it, what part about I love about what you guys brought to me 
and now we're uh, partners together as producers, and we're uh, going to make a TV series out of it. Absolutely. And the thing that really interests me is what you guys put together. Besides the Bible, you put together 12 episodes. You have the storyline treatment. Everything is down. Each character, each character is individualized, uh, and the characteristics of that guy and that guy are there are unique. Yep. And then the most important part about this is the information that you guys accumulated. You guys accumulated actual photos, police records. That's right, police records. Uh, police, actual police photos, yeah. surveillance photos. Yeah. I mean, so interesting. Headlines. You guys did a lot of work putting this all together. That's what really excited me on this whole, the whole story. But in reality, when we talk about gangs and murders, you know, I used to be a homicide detective, and I knew about this. But this, to me, is a story that has to be told. And part of the story is that, again, they were already uh, all over the city, and they were used by the Gambinos. They actually were under an indictment before the commission indictment, right. which I worked on the commission after I retired from the New York City Police Department. And I think... A little bit of a, a little bit of characteristics about some of the characters who we uh, have in our portrayal in our TV series. Sure, sure. So Roy DeMeo was the the head of the crew. He was slightly older than his underlings. He was a butcher by trade. This guy came from, for all intents and purposes, you know, a middle class family. But he was the black sheep of the family, and his actual passion in life was to become a made man in, in the mafia. He had family that were professors at Brooklyn Law School, doctors. These are educated people. But this guy's kind of thing in life was, was that. He wanted that life. So he starts doing what he could to maneuver in the 60s, and he notices this young bunch of disorganized misfits misfits yeah they were they were car thieves they were they were stealing radios and hubcaps and things like that not affiliated with organized crime at all with any bosses with any captain with anybody and he sees them and he and he figures early on that he can use them in his bid to become a made man in the gambino family become like the best crew of murderers absolutely there are. and so what happens is they there's a bad car deal that goes bad um, they want to seek revenge on this uh, person that they dealt, did business with. And one of them says, hey, did you know about Roy DeMeo? He's, he runs stuff out of this bar on, uh, on Flatlands. And uh, he's, ah, okay, so they set up a what meeting. What was the name of that bar? That was uh, the Gemini Lounge on Troy and Flatlands. Notorious Gemini Lounge. Notorious. And interestingly, last I checked, it's a church. <laughs> yeah, it's a, it's a church, church. Uh, Baptist church. Uh, hallelujah. Which, <laughs> hallelujah. And, and we had talked about this when we were talking about doing a, uh, 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 docu a docu-series yeah. where they didn't have forensic technology back then. But if we went into that church today, I guarantee you, you're going to find some interesting stuff. Uh, so, so that's where uh, I'd say 80% of the killing happened in that lounge. Uh, the front part of the lounge was a bar. Closer to the back room. part of the lounge was a um, kind of an apartment with a yeah. side door, and that's where they lured people in to do this. But let me tell you a little more about, about these ind individuals. But before we get into the individuals, uh, I, I read a little bit about Roy DeBauer. I read the book Murder Machine. Sure. Uh, and for all intents and purposes, before he was really found out, he was kind of an upstanding citizen. He owned several businesses. Was it true that he was part of a board of a credit union? He was, but that was later that on. That was later on. That, that was already when he had his hands dirty and he was doing all kinds of things. But yeah, so he, so he was, was able to camouflage. Well, he was yeah. very, very intelligent, and that's part of the problem. He masked what he was doing. He was actually on boards of directors for a credit union. He was owners in legitimate companies, but then he had this whole other life that he was he was leading. And he was then a, a certain, stone cold a fucking stone cold killer. killer. And, and I, I think it's important to say while he was the stone cold killer, but at, on the surface, a family man, uh, a community man, um, this story is told through the perspective of the heroes that brought these guys down. That's right. The archetype character, Eddie Creighton, who's a detective equally flawed and intelligent and equally matched to Roy DeMeo. Well, I gotta explain to I gotta explain to the listening audience. There was a detective that was involved with it, an Irish detective. And what we did was 
we put together for entertainment value where he has a, a cause. It's like a cat and mouse thing. Of course, in reality, the real detective had this obsession with Roy DeMeo and his crew. So we capitalized on that. When you, when you watch a TV series, you like to see the characters come to life. Yeah. So we have the two main characters are this Irish detective that is obsessed with DeMeo. And DeMeo, who's obsessed with this Irish detective, he gives you that that cat and mouse thing throughout mm. the series where he's trying to get him. And then we put together about that the detective father was a former prosecutor who went after the mob and actually died of a heart attack. And, and the young cop coming out of the academy was in the courtroom watching his father. He's having a heart attack. And then all these wise guys were the case is dismissed and they're walking out high five and and this detective never forgot that and he became obsessed with this i love that storyline because you really can relate to it yeah and to me something that is real palatable is something that you can relate to and certainly we can relate to that that cat and mouse thing you know but, but it's important that the detective in this is really a composite based on your experience, yeah. my experience as a former prosecutor in the Bronx, all of the cops that were involved in this investigation, the FBI, the way right, we... Right, but of course, you know what? A lot of people don't realize one cop doesn't do it. Exactly. No way. One detective doesn't do it. It's a joint effort. But in reality, when you want to make something that's interesting where people turn it on and watch it and yeah. watch it every week you want to have a character that people hate or love right and that's right. important yeah and you have to be i know invested. enough about movie business i produce a lot of movies and i've been involved with a lot you've got to have the interest you just can't throw stuff there and, and and not have an interest and i think it's that's where we're going to win with it yeah. is the development of the storyline that w we've put together Go ahead, I'm and, sorry. And Absolutely. the way that we've framed it is uh, Detective Eddie Creighton, on a, a patrolman on a routine run for a, a knife, a gunpoint uh, robbery, observes these guys coming out of the Gemini Lounge. He has a marble notebook. He takes down the license plate numbers, and on his own time, he goes and he surveils the lounge and he sees Epoli he, he sees a, a, a someone come out who turns to be out to be the character of Epolito, a crooked NYPD cop. I worked with. Uh, Louis and we, we, the real one. We, we, we weave that character into it. Uh, Eddie Creighton follows his car. He follows the car that's following him, and he finds out that it's the U.S. Attorney's Office. He delivers a ticket to the U.S. Attorney's Office, begins to talk to them. They include him in his investigation right. about NYPD federal, they make corruption. A, a, he worked in a good join with the federal, with the feds. Right. And I've worked on a couple of cases where he worked in conjunction together yeah. with the feds. Yeah. He, he becomes seconded to the FBI as a special investigator. And through that investigation of NYPD corruption, they unveil this uh, murderous, ra you know, raging murderous gang. And this story is told against the tapestry of New York during its one of its epic eras, from 1969 well, to 1982. The murders of 1970s when I was a detective. Well, yeah, cop. Studio nice. 54, Woodstock. This is the French Connection era New York, like a Sidney Lumet, grainy yeah, lens. This is important for the listening audience to understand something. You know, when they did Goodfellas, when they did the Godfather. I'm talking about the, the gems of movie making and all that. They took composites of storylines. I mean, with the olive oil and all that, sure. and they turned it around. You've got to make something that's based on real. I mean, because the fact are, and I want to go through the characters yeah. again. I want to I individualize the character. Sure. But we've taken something that is a true story, yep. and obviously we want to make it interesting to the person that's watching it every week. But the fact is, Goodfellas was about Henry Hill that I knew was a broken down valise. Right. He wasn't a made guy. And then all of a sudden you've got the story going and you make that into the story. Jimmy Burke, who I knew also from Leffitt's Boulevard, Jimmy Burke played by Robert De Niro. So now it's all about entertainment, mm -hmm. about based on that Lufthansa heist. That's right. But now you put things in there in entertainment, something that works. That's right. And that's what we're going to do. And that's what this TV series is about, is take one of the most heinous gangs of murderers and base it on truth, but make character development. And some of those characters, talk about them, please. Sure. So as I was saying, Roy was the head. He was 
was a butcher by trade, and, and, and so we went through that. The crew itself was so unique. These guys had such, uh, I guess, interesting character traits themselves. They were all stone-cold murderers, uh, serial killers. You had Harvey Chris Rosenberg. What was he all about? He was, he was Jewish by, you know, blood. Uh, he did not really care for his ethnicity and his life's ambition. You couldn't even call it that, but that's what he wanted, was to be Italian. In the end... He winds up taking Roy DeMeo's name, which gets him killed in a bad uh, drug deal with Cubans. True story. <laughs> but here's the thing about him. He was such a maniac, such a lunatic, that he would show up at the Gemini Lounge for a, for a killing. He would strip down to his underwear so that his clothes wouldn't get full of blood. And after Roy shoots him, Roy would wrap a towel around their head, and as they're going down, Chris jumps out in his underwear with a butcher knife, starts stabbing the guy to get the heart uh, uh, to stop beating, and then they systematically dismember the victim. That's the why Gemini method. They yeah, call it, right? that's right. That's why most victims were never found, and most of the body parts wound up in the Fountain oh, Avenue yeah, dump. Yeah. The thing about Chris was he was meticulous about his clothes and fashion. He was into fashion and cars, so he didn't want to mess anything up. He probably killed like 60 guys by himself. And who else we got? You got Henry Borelli, which is another interesting character. This guy was married with three kids. Uh, still alive, he's doing time in, um, I forget the penitentiary. There's only three guys left alive from this whole crew, and it's Henry, uh, uh, Joey, and uh, Anthony. And uh, Henry, Henry started out good. He took Henry the test. Full, full name? Henry Borelli. He, start, he, he took the test to become an NYPD officer. And Lindsay wasn't hiring. He, he gets put on hold. And, you know, he's got three kids, a wife. He's got a put, you know, food on the table, so he starts to go this way, and eventually, um, you know, he, 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 he flies to Morocco, um, starts to sell hashish in Morocco, gets pinched in Morocco. They tell him, they let him go, and they tell him, you're banned from the country, you can never come back. Morocco comes into play later on in the story. Comes back, joins up with the crew, and actually is instrumental in, in bringing everybody together to meet with Roy. Then you got the Gemini twins. Who are they? That's Joey Testa, Anthony Center. Joey had a very affable personality, funny type of guy. Anthony, when you looked at him, you knew right off the bat he was a stone cold killer. Mm -hmm. You could just tell. These guys weren't related by blood, but they were, they were best friends from teenagers. And most of these guys were teenagers at so the time. So hence the uh, Gemini twins. Gemini twins, because they hung out at the Gemini Lounge. Who else? Um, you had um, Freddie Denome. <laughs> this guy's, I wanted you to talk Fred, about him. This Freddie really Denome, in and of himself, is a total subplot and, and a character that can arc in this a story and be, uh, be a spin off <laughs> show because it, we call him Broadway Freddie Denome. He drove hot rods for the National Hot Rod Association. He kept a pet monkey with him by his side. So when, when, he, when they would have sit downs, Roy would tell him, Freddie, I told you to leave the monkey home. And he would say, Come on, Roy. We're going to hurt her feelings. Like, he yeah. was completely out of it. The so monkey he, is written into the show. The monkey's right? in the show. The monkey pumps gas at his gas station. <laughs> <laughs> right? This guy, this guy was a killer. You know, very affable, funny guy. But, uh, and the cars that he drove were phenomenal. He was obsessed with Saturday Night Fever, which came out, what, 70? Six, I think. Something like, like that? 76, He's got one of his cars, actually. He, he made the entire car Saturday Night Fever with John Travolta on the, uh, on the hood of the car. Oh, he pumped, uh, painted him on the Yeah, hood. you got to see this car. It's incredible. Yeah. And he used to drag race out in Coney Island. He's another one that killed many, many people. And then probably rounding off the crew was Vito Arena, who was the gay hitman, who, you know, uh, was actually a character, I believe, in um, uh, Sopranos. Yeah, well, that's... This another, is the real guy. Well, you know, that, that's another one, is that the, the Sopranos... In case people don't know, it's a composite of, of a course. lot of different things. You have the, uh, you had the, uh, you know, the crew over there out of Jersey, the Bobby Manners crew yeah, and right, all that. Right. So and that, that, people have to understand when you do something with entertainment value, you want to be able to let people in there. You don't want it flat. You know, you could tell this yeah. story; it could be flat. Yeah. Oh yeah, you got a bunch of murders, yeah, kill people. That's it. No, yeah. we got to. Uh, that's what's so important about when we're producing this is that we got to give them everything we got, and we got to make sure that the interest is picked up on this. Mm -hmm. So yes. when we accept the Emmy Award together, that's right. We have to have smiles on our that's face. All. But, we will. Oh, oh, I, <laughs> we I will wanna, indeed. I want to just expound on that a little bit because. The way in which we weave the real characters into the tapestry of fiction 
is not caricatured. It's not cartoonish. We've seen that a little bit in some of the uh, pieces that have been done in, in the mob genre. This is going to elevate the genre and, frankly, the serial killing genre right. and create a cinematic synergy that's very uh, uh, specific and unique and maybe create a whole new genre. Uh, Joseph mentioned Henry Borelli and his contact with Morocco. Uh, Roy DeMeo was brilliant, and he had an international car theft ske scheme. Mm -hmm. They would rob the cars, scratch the VIN numbers, and ship them over to the Middle East and make a huge markup. They did this for years. He made millions of dollars, made the Gambinos very happy and very wealthy. We actually weave that into the plot. Borelli... Uh, but this is part of the true story. This, but true. It is, but we tether the yeah. facts to the fiction very, very tightly. It, it's so, like Lufthansa in Goodfellas, right. how yeah. that was like the main... Yeah. So, so uh, Henry Borelli has Moroccan contacts. He develops those contacts. And through this international car theft ring, he actually uses Roy's contacts at the United Nations that they developed through extortion and blackmail. They use the diplomatic pouch to conduct their business <laughs> through the UN. Yeah. And they conduct this business over the, over the decade. They make a lot of money. So this is, it's a vast and rich tapestry. These, com these characters are complex. Yeah. They have great arcs each in and of themselves. You talk about composite characters. <laughs> We've got, let's talk about some of the composite characters. Father Carmine, the cigar-chomping, suave parish priest who conducts a gambling operation in the basement of the church and has uh, some beautiful girlfriends. Father Carmine is a character... Uh, I thought you weren't supposed to have girlfriends when you're a priest. Well, now it's actually... If it's a girlfriend, we will take it. <laughs> Jesus. Yeah, you're right. And that, that will change like meat on Friday. So, so uh, uh, he's a rich, colorful character. We have Kitty Leary, who's uh, our news person who, who, who has a beat in the news, and she hooks up with Mary Father Murphy. Carmine. Mary yeah. Murphy, yeah. Channel 11. That's right. And, and, and she, she hooks up with, uh, with Joe Colombo and the Italian Civil Rights League, and we weave that into the story. All of the characters against the tapestry of the, of the 70s and 80s mm -hmm. that are unique to the mob experience at its zenith you know, um, you know, a lot, a lot of people listening in. You know, a lot of people talk about stories. We have had some other authors on here, and and people involved in the movie business wanting to get involved. A lot of people don't realize what happens when you have a project. We have ten episodes. You've guys done a masterful job of putting the treatment, the pilot, to get a lead off on ten episodes. But what happens is you get a showrunner. Mm -hmm. You don't have a showrunner. You ain't running no show. That's someone that brings in a composite of maybe six, eight screenwriters they bring in because they got to bang these things out. And whatever verbiage we have, and we do understand one thing, and I know from experience, one tough cop, they had me killing 40 people. I didn't kill 40 right. people, but they wanted that in there. They had me screwing my best friend's girlfriend, which is not in my DNA. They wanted it in there. I had to accept that screenplay, and otherwise it wasn't going to happen. And I think that we've reserved the fact that whatever we got to do, we're going to make a TV series. Because you know what happens with stuff like this? If we we if, if we try to do a Stallone, I want to be the actor, I want to be the writer, I want to be everything that could die on the vine. Mm -hmm. We're going to get a TV series made. And it's going to be on TV. It's going to be a great TV series. So in reality, we do understand. Yes. Whoever we bring in, we have we've uh, together are all in agreement. We want to get it done. Of course, because I've seen too many yeah. things, too many stories die on the vine. Yep. Yeah. And that's not this ain't dying on but, the vine. But one one thing we need to address about that is, and there's been a lot of interest about this story. We're looking for the right fit. Mm -hmm. This is an industry that's driven by pure ego. Yep. And people see a new product, new faces, they're immediately thinking how to position themselves to either own it 100% or how do we get these guys out. This is a project that is perfect no, for the flat platform. We're going to be three producers and we're staying all the way on it. Like my friend did, you know, the, the uh, that movie, The Green Book. Great movie. Great movie. Like, you know, it's about my friend Tony Lip. Tony Lip, I got, I casted him in Rails with Martin Scorsese and Ellen Lewis when we casted 12 people, including Frankie from Rails. Out of Rails, 
with Martin Scorsese and uh, Ray, uh, Ray Liotta was there. Mm. Tony Lippa had come there, and we casted him as the captain in the Copa in the movie Goodfellas. But my point is that now all of a sudden his son, yep. his son says, you know, my father's a great story about this thing with this black piano player and all that. And he stood by it. And when he accepted the Best Picture Award, he was on that stage. 100%. He said, I'm not letting go of it. Yeah, no way. And he yeah. was there. No way. Listen, we're, 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 we get how it works. We're flexible. We have a wish list, of course, yeah. like everybody, what we would want. And I'll tell you this, we're, right here at this table, we're capable of taking this the full distance and surprising any executive and running the show ourselves. We're not looking to do that. We want to bring the right team together. We want to bring some A-list talent to the name, table. Name, big screen, a big uh, uh, showrunner, big, big show name, runner. big but, names but, but, of a but to Tim's, teams. But Timothy's point, a showrunner that is willing to, to work with us and put ego a little bit it, to the side. A little bit. You know, yeah. where we can get this done together well, I think what we got, as a cohesive I group. think what we got is uh, there's no reason why we can't no implement way. what we got I, and make I, it into a big, big 100%. Big I just want to say this because this is very important to us, and, and, and you remember this through your hundreds of phenomenal connections in this business. We had a really uh, great meeting with Nicholas Pileggi. Everybody knows Nick Pileggi. He wrote uh, uh, Goodfellas and Casino, uh, nominated for an Academy Award. We had, a, we had such a wonderful meeting with Nick in your office and went through this with him, kind of the way we're doing now. He loved it. And at that point, we were still in the process of writing things and tweaking things. And he said, and he gave us some pointers. And he said, you guys do this. Come back to me and, and, and let's see what you got. So we did that. We took a few months. We updated it. We put some motivation, some different twists, sent it off. And that was it. A few months later, my cell phone rings. I see Beverly Hills. I said, wow, Beverly Hills. I never get a call from Beverly Hills. So I picked the phone up. It's him. He's on the phone for over 30 minutes, and what he said in sum and substance was that the visual pitch site that we put together is one of the best that he's ever seen. And as far as the pilot, he said it was phenomenally done, and he said to me, and this I'll never forget, he said, Joe, he said, you stay at this and you just keep doing this because someday somebody's going to say yes and you're going to get this done in a big way. And I said, thank you very well, much. Well, you know, so, and you also, know, you know, a lot of people always say, I took this out to uh, Leonardo DiCaprio's sure. production team. You know, the, the problem, as a matter of fact, I even pitched it to uh, Harvey Weinstein's former president. What, what was the name I had lunch with? Uh, um, Merrill, Merrill uh, Poster. Merrill Poster, I was yeah, there. I was, uh, yeah. No, no, I just had lunch with her last week. Okay. My point is that... Like I said, a lot of things you got. We got to be very strong, and then we're, we're actually meeting with somebody in a little while from now that can make it. Shows a sincere, perky interest. Yeah. It's all about them drinking the Kool Aid. Hundred percent. If they believe in us, yeah. and we're going to get it done, we're going to get, gonna it, get done. it done. Yeah. We're going to get and, this and, done. And what 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 we say is your preconceptions about yourself, career, thematically, where the studio is headed, whatever algorithms Netflix is using, this is about what people love to see. The next day at the water cooler, people are going to be talking about this. this well, is we know one thing. They had that crap that comes on every week, Walking Dead. I mean, come on. Yeah. I mean, but people tune in there. That's when we did vinyl. They released it, HBO, one of the guys got fired because of that, Lombardi, I think his name was. They released it at the same time Walking Dead. Walking Dead has 14 million psychopaths that watch that every Sunday. You, If you want to have something that's going to be successful, you don't launch it against a no. tidal wave like right. that. No way. Right. And I just want to say this, that the story... The, the series starts in the late 60s, takes us through the 70s. 75 was the year where they killed the most people, these guys. And it ends at the culmination of all the law enforcement work in 1981-ish, 82. And then, then we know what happened in the big indictment with the Gambinos. 100 percent. Which this is right. part of. Was what, you 83? The, the, 85. 85. No, 85 the was the, 85 the commission. Was the, commission. the commission was 85. Yeah. This was 82. 82, 82 83. 82, 83. 82, 83. Right. Yeah, so a lot of people don't understand. This was actually mentioned in the 
original indictment against the Gambinos, that was prior to the commission case, which was the five crime families in That's New York right. City. Right. And, and by the way, who, was, took, yeah. who took that case to the mat on the on the legal side was Rudy Giuliani, and who is he's a alluded to. He's a composite character in, 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 this as in well. the script. And, and I would say this to all the listeners out there and to anybody that knows about that life, they'll agree with me that this case, 80, 81, 82, 83 to 5, this was the beginning of the modern day mob as we know it. That was it. Once this case hit, and, and Paul Castellano was named in the indictment that we have, he was still alive at this point, and the commission case was the nail in the coffin, that was the beginning of the end. And we tell that story, and, and it's this cat and mouse, it's this, it, it's all of these things woven together, and really the focus is on the law enforcement end, which we really haven't seen to date. I mean, you saw it a little bit in Donnie Brasco, but that was very different. He, he infiltrated the mob. This cop was brazen, and and he taunted these guys, and his was his life's ambition to bring mm. this case to, to fruition, and, and he saw it through to the end. And, and, and gentlemen, had, let me just ask you a quick question. We talked about, you know, you're in the midst of it, you're pushing it, you want to get this project done. But let's step back a little while, because you are not from the movie business, you're not from the TV business. You're two attorneys, you're you are know. both attorneys by trade. What led you to pick up on this story and to decide to create a TV series on it? Sure. Well, first of all, uh, we are both attorneys. I've been practicing for 18 years, Joe. Yeah. I'm about 20, 20. 21 now. Um, we have had different backgrounds in career. Both of us have worked together as lawyers through pro bono work and, and some other cases, which is how we met Bo. Um, I was a prosecutor in Bronx County, uh, general crimes, homicides, and gang. Uh, I did that for five years and met a lot of wonderful law enforcement. It, it is, the, whole, it is uh, the pinnacle in many ways of my career. Uh, it, it, I had the most cocktail party stories from that experience, <laughs> and I'm very proud of it. The, the police characters in this come from my experience as a prosecutor, also uh, Bo's experience as a detective. Joseph and I are very close. I've, I've been an actor, a singer, uh, and, and a writer, <laughs> as well as a lawyer. You were that guy in the Bronx still that walked behind the bus and back at that other guy? <laughs> <laughs> no. Stage acting. Um, what are you, great. friggin' Shakespeare? I, I've done Shakespeare. Hell, you do Shakespeare too? No. Alas, no. Paul Yorick. No, never mind. <laughs> anyway. Don't tell me you sing opera too. I do. Uh, you want to uh, hear something? Paul Savino. Oh, we gotta no, 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 it's not that. Um, it's not that. So, uh, you look like it. A guy that would sing out with that freaking old tie. When, when we rap, you're going to do a tune. Right, just give me one concerto. Do a... Uh, come on. Come on. Full time. Recondit harmonia Di bellezze diverse Veru e florido the rest I'll hey, let you. if we don't make this, we can get you over by Puglia, <laughs> and we can have you standing at the table. <laughs> I, I wanted to do that for well, you for a yeah, long time. Okay. <laughs> but, uh, you know, it, again, you guys, you guys are lawyers. This is an uh, exciting thing. I think the synergy between all of us, and I do understand exactly your feelings about this is like a baby project of ours, a baby project, from baby, now it's becoming an adult. Yes. And it's important, you know, what we put, but all I can say, my experience, is we want to stay involved. Yes. 100%. Yes. And we're going to do that. We're, we're going to be strong. If I got to grab a guy by the throat, whatever we got to do, we're not going to fade easy. No. Yeah. No okay. way. Just, just back to the story, because I, I know I got off on a tangent a little bit. A little bit. Just, thing just a little. Uh, Are we going to do a request? Joseph, I have uh, a request. Well, when we go to Rayo's, I'll get up and sing. <laughs> um, Joseph uh, uh, knew of this story yeah. and uh, brought it uh, to me. We, how we, did you find all this shit that you got in that briefcase? Yeah, the research we, we, is amazing. We, we've done, we've, listen, Bo, it's, it's not something that happened in uh, six months. As you know, I've been working on this for a really long time. I, I've never seen 
what's in that suitcase. Yeah. What yeah. I've seen in that suitcase, the, the actual police records, photographs, surveillance. I mean, you it's guys, the newspapers, you guys got it all. Part of my feeling are, you know, we could splash that stuff sure. during the show. Yes. Splash it out. Yep. Splash it out. Yep. Then you also, you, we also have f- newsreels, and I think that shows the real, realistic value yeah. of this show. Absolutely. This is not just a make-believe walking no, dead no, 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 of no. about a bunch of freaking zombies. No. These are real people These- <laughs> that were murdering mother effers. Listen. There's a story, and a true story, about Dominic Ragucci. And if the family's listening, I, my heart goes out to you to this day. Um, this kid was a St. John's University student. He was a, a vacuum cleaner salesman. He was selling vacuums door to door to get through college. Don't tell me he went to the Gemini Lane. He showed up at Roy DeMeo's house on Long oh. Island, and he was sitting in front taking some notes. And Roy was inside with Joe Dracula Guillermo, his cousin, and they mistook this kid for a Cuban hitman because he had a dark complexion. He's an Italian kid. And they proceeded to run out. The kid knew something was up. They're coming out with guns. And he took off. There was a high-speed chase. He wound up getting killed. I forget what route it was on, but they executed him. This was a completely innocent kid. These guys would, there was a certain point in time, you have to understand, where they were hunting people like animals, and they were killing for fun. They took on these godlike complexes. And, and, and it was, you know, if you looked at, so you, you hear these stories all the time. Ah, the guy looked at me the wrong way, you're getting a fight. No, you looked at these guys the wrong way, they said hello to you, and two minutes later you were in the car and you were dead. How does the, you know, because Carlo asked me, how does the Iceman fit? fit? The, the Iceman and the, and the Westies, that's the, another The Westies are a big, they're, they're I mean, part of our plan. It ties in so much. Yeah, that, they're part uh, of our plan. So you had Mickey Spillane, who, you know, was uh, the head of the Westies. Mickey Featherstone. Well, Spillane first, right? Uh, there were some issues with the, the, the Javits Center when they were building yeah. the original Javits Center, and Castellano and then Gambinos, he was giving them problems, and let's just say that Mickey was no more. Mickey Featherstone, I believe, takes over at that point. He becomes a rat. And, you know, they, they, there's a certain point in time where they, uh, they uh, have an alliance with the Gambinos, and that's kind of when everything changed. Um, and, and the Westies, you know, they ran the West Side. But get back they, to the Iceman thing. So the Iceman, listen, there's different takes on that story. You, mm-hmm. You've seen the actual movie, and you'll see that Roy DeMeo, Roy DeMeo and this crew, by the way, to the general public in America, for everybody listening out Midwest, they really don't know who this guy is. He's, there's been some documentary work on him. He's been a, a, a small bit character in, in, the, in the Iceman uh, movie. There's different stories about the Iceman. Which one is true, which one is not, we're not 100% sure. But this, this I've heard over so many years of doing this. He was deathly afraid of Roy DeMeo. I don't but, care but, how many but, guys. But the Iceman's based on his stories. But how much did he exaggerate? And I think he exaggerated know. a lot. Yeah. Um, I, you know, and when they did that HBO thing, I was said to myself, they're so off the mark yeah. with this. You know, if they knew the real deal about these guys, that's what they should be focusing yeah. on. Um, so, you know, uh, you got the Westies in there. You've got um, later on, you've got, uh, um, you've got Kuklinski, but, you know, Will he be part of this? Sure, we'll, he's we'll write him in. I mean, he's a peripheral they character. They focused on that character, but they, that was not even a tip of the iceberg. But I like, I like, I like what we, what we put together about this crew. Yeah, it's. I mean, he wasn't he wasn't having tea over blood popping out with the, the mayo and the rest of the guys. No, he wasn't having barbecue in the back of the Gemini Lounge. No way. That. So if he passed through it once in a while, I, he's a non-entity. Yeah. I like the story about this crew. This was a tight crew. Am I tight, correct? Very yeah. tight crew. These guys were very, very tight. They stayed together until the end when it started to unravel. Some guys flipped. Some guys got killed. Three guys are left. Um, you know, it, 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 and, and, and while the crew and these gangsters are essential theme and part of this story, again, it's, it's, it's different than the things that we've yeah. seen. These guys, and you know this, Bo, these, these guys not only worked for the Gambinos. They, they were contract killers. They worked for all five families mm. because they were so good at what they did. And they worked for families outside of New York and New Jersey as well. So if you want someone whacked in yeah. New Jersey. Sure. And in you Philadelphia, would, too, would I Bobby think. Bobby Manis crew. And, and they send Detroit. Them 
That's yes. Florida. That's the serial killer part of this. Serial right. killers with silk ties. Th- th- 100%. This might be the first time in documented history where a group killed as a pack. That's like right. wolves. That's right. And y- y- you talked about the God complex, but actually there are uh, moments and examples where they actually had the opportunity to kill. They set it up and decided not to do it because it felt so good to them that they could take and give life. Mm-hmm. Uh, so these were completely psychotic people, and, and, and they loved it. They enjoyed it. Right. They, they, they had a method. They perfected it like a science, and they instilled fear in the heart of the mob itself. They didn't know how to control these guys. Right. Do you know what that's similar to? That's similar to the character from Schindler's List, the guy that ran the concentration camp. Yeah, yeah. Who, there was this, there's a famous scene where he's target practicing from, from some tower, and but he only did that. Uh, no, th- there was that scene, but there was another where, um, where he Liam Neeson's him. character yeah. convinced him to, you know, it's more powerful to to, to uh, pardon, to pardon right. and to not take life, to let the person live. the right. power of taking life. But he couldn't do it. So <laughs> he, in the, he couldn't in do the it. script, he actually, actually winds up killing. We actually, through Vito Arena, who's the, the gay hitman down in the village, these guys perfect their diabolical craft by going down to the village and killing people with him. They see him kill someone and, and they say, you know what, you mind if we tag along? We would like to you know, help <laughs> right. you out. It was an apprenticeship. Right. Yeah, kind and of. That's, and, and so, so there's a whole They were demand. also involved, I mean, I know a lot of uh, crime families were involved in the gay bars in the 70s. Oh, with absolutely. The, oh, yeah, yeah. They owned a absolutely. lot of them. And, mm. and, for, and that's part of the tapestry. That's what makes this so colorful. Right. That, the Studio 54 era. Regimes. Joseph, you mentioned the Regimes. Peppermint yeah. Lounge. Yeah. Yeah. Joseph uh, alluded to the Cubans. There's a, a link with the, with the Cubans and Cuban drug dealers. And Henry Borelli was involved somewhat with the cocaine cowboys. Is that correct? That's right. That's right. That's right. And, and, and again, the cop is always right there he's telling them he's he's in mixing with them Roy the male one of his one of his uh, character traits was to try and get the cop to flip you know you know what there's there's one aspect of one of my favorite movies that just happened to be in it of goodfellas and when i wrote my book it was kind of copied off of it they call it italics it's when the person is talking about what he's feeling and voiceover like they did in Goodfellas. Right, right. Uh-huh. I love the way that is because it brings the audience viewing what feelings yeah. he had, right. and that could be something that we could put. Because yeah. yeah. if it's going to be based on our fictitious law enforcement guy, it could be the story from his point of view yeah. where he's feeling, I couldn't believe that these guys got in the car right then, and then all of a sudden they grabbed this guy. You know, what I'm saying is now you're listening to a voice. Yeah, yeah. no, that, that exactly. Could be great. And I could see that playing out. There's, there's a true story where uh, Roy is in a bar. The barmaid is behind the bar, serves a drink. Place is kind of empty. Kid walks in, says to Roy, what the F are you looking at? Well, okay, you know, buys him a drink. Come over. He befriends him in that moment. He says, come on, we'll go to another place for another drink. They leave. He sits in the car, and the barmaid watches Roy take the gun out and blow his brains out. Over just nothing. Over nothing. One, one thing I wanted to talk about, just to show how the institutional corruption is intertwined in this and how rich it can be, the, the characters of the corrupt NYPD cops that we have in here, we actually have them planting bugs in Eddie Creighton's house, and the mob has ta- tapped the police, <laughs> and that's how they find out who's flipped, and they carry out their hits yeah, through I think, those. I think we talked about actually we had another phone installed for the informants. That's right. In that's right. House. And that's what prompts and, and in the And another interesting piece of the cop is that, you know, after doing what he did so hard for so many years, he actually wound up garnering the respect of some of these people. And when they knew that the, the jig was up and they were going to have to flip or get killed, they would often call him to, to flip because they knew he would treat them as a gentleman. Well, I'm going to tell you, so I'm, I'm excited. We have, a, we have a big meeting in a little while. That's right. And uh, I hope that we end up getting off on this. And to me, this is a very, very interesting project. And I hope to be standing with you guys when we get the Emmy on this well, thing. Amen. And uh, we, we're going to wrap it up. But uh, just we do something every week. We do Punk of the Week. Mm. Punk of the Week means it could be a thing, mm. a person, or whatever that pisses you off. <laughs> so who is your Punk of the Week, Joe? My Punk of the Week 
<laughs> I have a few, but I'll tell you the one that happened today. Yeah. I'm waiting for my brother. We're at the TikTok diner up the block, and I'm standing there. And I'm in this place all the time. So I asked for a table, and the girl comes up to me. She says, oh, we're busy. So what do you mean you're busy? Well, we can't seat you until your other party is here. I said, are you kidding? What am I, at the Ritz? <laughs> so I had to sit there and wait. You know what the TikTok yeah. diner no, is. So you, know, Greasy so you yeah. know what the problem is? Here's the problem. The problem is, is that... Today, there's no more loyalty. There's no more respect. That, that, there's no more respect. You you frequent the place. Come on, you treat the person the so right way. So she's your punk of the week. That's right. What's her name? I don't know. Althea. Althea later. Okay. <laughs> Timmy, what's your punk of the week? Joseph and I are born and raised in Greenwich Village. Our family on the Italian side goes back four generations by Washington Square, and we've seen a lot of change, good and bad. We found out uh, this week that one of the restaurants on Carmine Street across from Our Lady of Pompeii Church, Trattoria Spaghetto, that has a legendary oh, yeah. green facade, it's been there all of my life, uh, has gone out of business. Wow. And they upped the rent to $42,000 a month. We've seen... We've seen Little Italy. Our institutions. These yeah. restaurants are cultural institutions. Rocco's on Thompson Street, El Paso. Rocco's, on, Marilyn Monroe and Joe DiMaggio. Well, right there. Little, little Italy there. Now it's all, if you, you go in there for meatballs and spaghetti, you get uh, noodles it's a with joke. soup. I you went know. to Vincent's the other day because I wanted to get Scongeal yeah. and Calamari. They were closed. It was a Wednesday. So I said, I'll go, to, <laughs> I'll go to Umberto's. Big mistake. We go to Umberto's, and I ask for it. Where's, where's the scongeal? There's no scongeal. They took it off the menu. Oh, yeah, oh, yeah. Oh, God. There's an oven. Well, that's your pocket. You, call you got anything? Oh, uh, yeah. My former dog walker quit unexpectedly on me. Now my poor dog's home alone with no walk. i got to find a replacement. So you know what you do? You just get one of those big pots. You get a cover. You put the pot cover on it. Put in a couple of air holes. You tape it up there. Drop your dog in the pot. He can't go nowhere. And when you come home, you take the pot. They'll be happy. She's to see 85 you. pounds. I don't know if that'll work. Well, be in a bigger pot. <laughs> bring, bring your dog to work. Well, my mine's very obvious. My punk in a way. We, I have two punks. Uh -huh. Our current mayor and his wife. Yeah. And I want to know where 1.8 billion dollars goes. And a little birdie tells me <laughs> they're two criminals. And we're going to find out it's going to be one of the biggest thefts of this city's history. I guarantee this guy here, he's a criminal. And you know what? When you sleep in bed with a criminal, it's like bugs, bed bugs. When you sleep in a bug, bed, bug, bug, bug bed, what do you catch? <laughs> you get bit. Yeah. <laughs> so that's my pocket of the week. Call up some plugs. Right, before we go, there's one more thing. Uh, one more question i got to ask you guys because yeah. we didn't talk about it. Uh, Dracula Guglielmo, because he's <laughs> one of the craziest characters I've ever read about. Right. Yeah, we're, so. We're going to do a CGI of Bella Lugosi. <laughs> no, I'm just kidding. <laughs> he's, uh, he's Roy's cousin, and his main job was to, you know, most social clubs that ran, you know, throughout the years, they always had kind of a caretaker of the social club. He was the caretaker of the Gemini Lounge, and when they would do this murder where, you know, kind of like you could envision it and you could visualize it uh, uh, cinematically where, <laughs> you know, the victim comes walking through the door, slow motion. The victim comes walking through the door. Roy's there with a silencer. He hits him, wraps a towel around his head like a turban. Guy's going to the floor. Chris jumps out with the knife. Boom, boom, boom. They take the guy into the bathroom. They hang him upside down. And they and and Dracula's job was to slit the neck, drain the body of blood in the bathtub. Blood Dracula, get it? Right. But he looked like Dracula. And too. by the way, he, yeah, did. he did. He did. He and, did. And by the way, they're having pizza next. Yeah. You know, in, 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 at a table like this, while yeah. the bodies are in there. And this, you know, hundreds of people went this way, and they they were never found. They were it's never found. Really, really compelling stuff. Uh, where can people find you guys? Well, they can find us through Bo. He's our he's our main man. And um, if, uh, if people are interested in, uh, I don't know, representation or, or, or talking with us about the project, I would say uh, feel free to reach out to Bo. Yeah, Bo's our point man. Bo, Bo's the man. Okay, so we'll set up, uh, if you have any questions or interest in the Flatlands project, you could send us an email to onetoughpodcast at gmail.com, as well as anything else related to the podcast. We answer every email, so if you'd like to get in touch with Joe and Tim, uh, just shoot us an email there. Uh, thanks, thank you guys for being here. Our other. Yeah, I'm going to give uh, our 
whole social media rundown. So uh, you could find us here every week. We record here at Cumulus Studios, Hackensack, Meridian Health, Stage 17. Beautiful brand new studio on the OG Podcast Network. Uh, you could find us on Twitter. We're at One Tough Podcast. You could find Bo at Bo Deedle, and you could find him at the real Bo Deedle on Instagram. We welcome all kinds of feedback. Keep giving us oh, great reviews. Oh, hold on Keep a second. I got to tell my audience. Last week I saw uh, Cohen, Michael Cohen, lying. Because he told me personally that he wanted a job to be chief of staff or uh, counsel to the president. Then I see him on TV listening and testify. He goes, I never wanted a job working for that slime bag president. He's a liar. So I, I tweeted it out. Well, Carlo tweeted, tweeted it out <laughs> that he's a liar. He told me on three occasions he wanted a job and he'll do whatever he had to do to protect him and his family. So I wrote the Twitter out there. I mean, and then Carlo put it out. Next thing is, the Congressman Meadows from North Carolina read my Twitter and put it in the congressional record. Then we got one million hits. Wow. Wow. That's amazing. Powerful, huh? That's powerful. Amazing. Very powerful. The power of social media. Absolutely. Can I do a shameless plug for Absolutely. my podcast? Plug whatever you'd like. I, I also co-produce and co-host a history podcast called Barstool Historian. And for people who like to talk about history like... What's people, a barstool? It's the one that we're sitting on right now. Just pull up a, bar a, stool. a I got a bar. Just pull up a glass of single malt, and you've got a bar stool. Yeah. So for people who <laughs> like to imbibe, I, I have no idea what you're talking about. Have bar. you ever sat at a bar stool? Yeah. So a bar stool historian, somebody who sits oh, at the bar, they sit, and talks, they get has drunk, has a glass of scotch, and they talk, and they, and talk, they talk, talk about it. history. Right. So ah. for people who like to talk about history and drink good beer and scotch, I invite you to listen. Barstoolhistorian.com. When is it on? Uh, we, we released through iTunes. Through well, How many you got? We have, I want to say, 12 episodes up there. Nice. And what kind of gotta subjects have, do you Got to have Bo as a what guest. What kind of history are you talking about? It's all of, of, of world history. Okay. Well, you should talk about NYPD history. And, and we will, I, we will I, do I happen to know world history, and I happen to know American history very well. All right. I love That was one subject that I was very astute in. I liked it. It was interesting, world history and American history. I didn't like math. Obviously, I didn't like English because I can't even talk. <laughs> well, you can get <laughs> you it through right, iTunes Paul. and Spotify and iHeartRadio and so forth. Good. Great. All right. BarstoolHistorian.com. BarstoolHistorian.com. Good. Joe and Tim, thank you very much thank for being you. here. Thank you we very much. We urge our audience, you know, whatever you have, just uh, send letters to every uh, channel and every uh, yes, production company please. that you want to see Flatlands. And uh, we'll see you next week. Thank, thank you, you very much. Thank you.